I'm super excited to be here. This is my first GopherCon UK. Um, and I'm visiting from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, but I actually used to work around the corner from here like eight years ago. And I worked in a call center for a restaurant group. But we didn't have an office. So they just put like a desk in the chef's changing room. Um, so this venue is way better. Uh, and so far, there's no like sweaty people swearing at me to get out of the way. Uh, but the day is young. Um, so I'm, so what was that? Wait till lunch, okay. Oh yeah, <laughs> gotta beat the queue for lunch. Um, I'm Sadie Freeman, I'm a senior backend engineer. I've been working with Go for about four years now and it was actually kind of my first programming language. I switched careers from HR to tech uh, and learned to code from a coding bootcamp. And when I got my first junior job, I was really lucky that I found something uh, in Go with a tech lead that really wanted to mentor someone. And I'm mentioning that because I don't come from a computer science background, and a lot of my talk is colored in by how I understand things working, and I like to use real world, world examples for that. I also really aimed with this to make it accessible for new Go users. Uh, I know a lot of us in the building will have been using Go for a while, so some of this, especially in the beginning part, might feel like a refresher, but I also wanted to consider online audiences who might be pretty new to it, or folks like myself a couple years ago attending their first GopherCon. I went to GopherCon in the States in 2019. Um, so I think Go is obviously super cool. Uh, I don't know if it's super common to be someone's first programming language, but by default, but I think it's more and more common as, as more and more companies obviously are, are using Go more and more. So I work for a company called Dapper Labs, um, and Dapper Labs is responsible for CryptoKitties, NBA Top Shot, and NFL All Day. Um, the latter two projects are things that I worked on, um, and they're all collectible blockchain NFT projects. In the case of NFL and NBA, um, they basically have the essence of like sports trading cards, but digital and on the blockchain. And I want to mention this at the beginning, because now that I've said the word blockchain, um, I do want to say that this isn't a blockchain-specific talk. It's really about Go routines and scaling, but using one of these projects as a case study. There's some additional info on some solutions that we found that are unique to blockchain challenges, uh, but for the vast majority of this hour, it's, it's relevant to any web service that needs to scale. So with all that said, um, I have a link here to my GitHub repo. This has a copy of the slides and, um, and some code examples if you wanted to follow along. Uh, there's a folder with each step that I'm going to walk through. And if you wanted to run the code progressively or like play around with it later, it's there and, and free to use. Um, I've added my Twitter account too if you want to chat. I'm not super active on there. I post a picture of my cat like once a year. Um, but I'm here for the rest of the conference too. and so like come chat and say hi. So uh, we will dive right in. Uh, the first and main chunk of my hour today is going to be running through a real world example of using Go routines to scale for speed and manipulating deployments to scale for increased load. And then I'm gonna talk about how we did this on NFL All Day, uh, which is a product that I worked on and helped launch earlier this year. I'm including a bit of an architecture overview of this project, uh, and then we'll talk about a case study of this specific part of it, uh, what we were able to achieve with it as we scaled. Um, this is also kind of set out like how you might start a project from going from this like very small basic example and building off of it. Um, because as we kind of know, building software works that way. Um, using like concurrency usually happens when you need to use it. It doesn't necessarily happen right away. So I wanted to show how that kind of naturally occurs. Cool. Um, this isn't a coffee break, uh, but I want to talk about coffee because I find it helpful to work off of analogies. Um, we are going to imagine collectively in this room that we've decided we've had enough of the like tech life and instead we're going to get together and we're going to open up a coffee shop. Um, for the purpose of this, we'll be the founders slash investors and our main goal and the big question today is how can we serve as many cups of coffee as possible to as many people as possible as quickly as we possibly can? 
And the way that we're going to do this is by focusing on both speed and load. So how quickly can we get customers in and out of the door? And then how much can we scale up the number of customers while still maintaining good speed? So we'll get together, pull some resources, and get set up. And uh, we're gonna be like a little hipster coffee shop that only does one coffee, and it's gonna be a flat white, because that's my favorite. So for every customer that comes in and orders a flat white, we're going to do three things. We'll take their payment, we'll steam the milk, and we'll make the espresso. And these are three actions that result in a customer getting their coffee. There's obviously like additional actions there, like putting the milk in the coffee, but I'm gonna kind of hand wave that, um, and we're gonna accept it. Uh, and it's, it's also worth noting at this point um, that these are three things that can happen independently of each other. They don't rely on the other being done for them to be a finished action. So let's say we've got our coffee shop all set up and we're gonna hire our first employee. Um, does anyone wanna volunteer? <laughs> Has anyone worked in hospitality before and wants to volunteer their name and nothing else? You don't have to get up, you don't have to do anything. Yes. Hello. What's your name? Carrot. 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 C <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can you spell it for me? No, no. Tell me. Tell me. Come a bit closer. Garrett. I'm so sorry. It's the accent. I swear. I know. I said I lived here. I lived here for like seven years, but I've been back in Canada for four, and uh, now I don't understand anything. Um, okay, Garrett. Thank you very much. You're gonna be our first employee at our coffee shop. Um, and you are gonna serve our customers. So now we're gonna to switch to writing this in actual code. Um, and, and this is where if you did wanna follow along in the project directory, you are more than welcome to. Um, the numbers at the top of each slide correspond to each step in the repo. Uh, and I'm gonna show the main pieces of code as zoomed in as possible with their printouts. I don't want this to be all just me showing you code. So there's some pieces like the package main declaration that I've left out for brevity. And also because I'm taking this as iteratively as possible, as if we were building this up from scratch tutorial style, there's some pieces here that aren't necessarily scale related, um, but they're there for the purpose of showing how this might be done in practice. Because I know that when I look at tutorials and talks and they jump from like, hey, here's this hello world printout to cool, now that everything's deployed in production, I'm like, oh, slow down, please. <laughs> um, so imagining this scenario through code, let's take three functions for each of these actions and run them one at a time through our main function. Uh, there's also a log here that tells us how much time this code takes to produce based on the start time as well. I know the lamp is warm, right? <laughs> okay, can you see now? Um, cool, uh, so in every function there's also a sleep. I just put that in as a two second delay uh, and then it's going to print the action out. The delay just makes it clearer so when we're looking at how long the function takes to run, um, we can see it there. And right now this is just a code file inside my editor and I can run this code with the command go run main.go. So if we run this in the terminal, we get this printout. And right now, it takes us about six seconds to make a cup of coffee. It takes Garrett six seconds to make a cup of coffee. Which makes pretty logical sense, given that we have two second delay for each of our, our, our actions, pretty fast. Um, and in our coffee shop example, this is just Garrett. He's running around, performing each of these actions and serving customer, customers um, all by himself. The only lonely employee. Um, <laughs> he's taking the payment, making the espresso, and then steaming the milk, and, and then serving the customer. So we're gonna continue with a bit of setup for the scenario. This is great, and this works, but we also wanna have this setup to serve more than one customer. Uh, and for making the purpose of making this a little more flexible, I wanna set this up as, as a server, because we're effectively building out a web service, and this will help us later when we package this up to deploy. So I've adjusted the code slightly here. 
so that the main function is using the HTTP package to set up a route that parses an optional parameter for the number of customers and loops through the number to make a coffee for each person. We're still testing the time it takes to run, and at the bottom we'll print out the number of customers and how long it takes to serve them. And I've also bundled the three actions here into a helper function called make coffee, and that's gonna run each action, each of the three coffee actions. So now when the program runs, we can make a curl command to a local host. If we try to serve three customers in one go, here's what we get. Um, and obviously, this is still based on Garrett being our only employee, and they're having to do each of these things individually. They go, take the payment, steam the milk, make the espresso, and then does the same for the next person, and so on. That's a lot of work, and this takes 18 seconds to complete because they're all alone. Um, and for every new customer we add, we're adding, we're adding six seconds. So we've reached our first problem to solve. So how do we make this quicker? How can we speed this up? Because we're, right now, for every customer, it takes the additional six seconds, and that's not scalable. And this is where we can use Go routines to help optimize for our first problem, which is speed. And this is where we want to introduce the idea of concurrency. So we have three actions here that can technically be done at the same time. Garrett is our star and only employee and doing a great job, but could be way more efficient if he had some help. So we're gonna hire a couple new employees, um, and now we have more people who can do the same job at the same time. And Go is really cool because to do that, you just add a keyword, Go at the beginning of the function call. Um, and this tells the program to call each function running simultaneously or concurrently. Um, and I, I always find Go routines kind of funny because when I got my first job in Go, everyone was like, oh, Go is so cool because of the concurrency. Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, I don't have a computer science background. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, but it also took me a long time to actually need to use Go routines for concurrency because generally in normal backend API development, they might not come up that often. It might, the need for it might not arise. Um, but obviously when it does, its usefulness is huge. So Go routines are unique to Go and they can be thought of as lightweight threads even though they aren't exactly threads. A uh, thread being a sequence of instructions inside a program that can be executed independently of other code. And what makes them powerful is that they can be used to run functions at the same time or concurrently. And ultimately, this is all you really need to know to get going with Go routines for the vast majority of use cases. Well, there's, there's obviously a lot more information out there about how they work and the ins and outs. So now that we've added a Go routine, we've turned our make coffee into a Go routine function, you'll notice from the printout that the logs coming in af are after the time elapsed, and the time is suspiciously short. And so we go and we talk to Garrett. And Garrett's like, yeah, well now that you've hired more people, things are a breeze and we have people in and out of the door in microseconds. And we're like, that doesn't track. We're getting suspicious, we've had a couple bad Google reviews, so we're gonna send someone down from head office to investigate. Um, it turns out that maybe Garrett didn't train the t new team members up, and they're kind of just like running around chaotically by themselves. They've like figured out their jobs, but they're not coordinating with each other. Um, so some people are just getting cups of steamed milk, and some people walk away with their coffee without paying, and we're losing money. So we decide to keep a closer eye, and we can invest in some training. Um, so we can use something called wait groups to make sure that all of our Go routines have finished before ending the program. That way we know for sure that everyone has had their coffee. And what we're using here is the sync package which allows us to create a wait for group variable. Then the built-in add function adds a counter for each Go routine we spin out. And we pass the wait group into the function we're using as a Go routine that calls wait group dot done which decrements that count. Then the wait group dot wait at the very end tells us to wait until that counter is back down to zero before continuing. 
And so while we're taking advantage of GoRoutines and concurrency, we're still making sure that everything is, is done before we finish the program. Um, we kind of gave Garrett a little too much free reign running the cafe, and we need to like rein him in a little bit. So we've hired a supervisor, um, but don't worry, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, basically, we're just making sure that every task gets completed before we give someone their coffee. And so now from the printout, you can see that the actions are happening at the same time, but the printout with the time only happens once everything is done. And this is success, right? We've got it down to six seconds per customer now because this is happening at the same time. Um, instead of those 18 seconds, we can now serve three customers coffee in, in six seconds. But we can still speed that up. We're still performing three, the three actions one after another, um, and, but those are things that can happen at the same time, right? And here's where we can look inside the initial function, which is running in a Go routine, to see if there's anything else that could run at the same time. And we do have that in our three actions from before. So I've made each of these three functions into their own Go routine and set up a new wait group inside the make coffee function, which waits for all three to finish before ending. And look at that result. We're down now to two seconds per coffee per customer because we have customers being served at the same time. We've also invested in some more employees and machines so we can take payment, make coffee, and steam milk at the same time. but we're greedy little investors. Um, Garrett and our other employees are doing a great job. They're serving lots of people. Um, and now we're like, we wanna start looking at numbers and how many people we can serve at the same time. So we can certainly hire more people and we start testing how many more people we can get through the door. And this is the new hurdle. So we've optimized now pretty well for speed, but we want to serve more customers many more customers. Um, so how do we scale to be able to handle how the load of having more customers? We have Garrett and our other employees running around serving coffee as fast as they can, but there's only so much that they can do to speed up. And if we wanna serve more customers, we need to see how we can serve more people at the same time. We're also getting some interest from other investors and maybe we wanna build up some franchises from our little coffee shop. Um, and we kind of need to be able to like package the success that we've had so that in theory we could open more stores. So some setup for this. Uh, we were gonna use the Docker, we we're gonna use Docker to package our little program up nicely so that we can like sell it to investors. I've added a Docker file with basic instructions to build an image of our program. Uh, first we import the base image, go 1.18. Then the work directory adds a directory inside the image. Copy, go mod, and go sum, and run go mod download sets up our modules, although we're not really using any in this example, our go mod is empty. Then we copy our source code into the image with the copy command and compile it using the run command. And then the last thing to do is add the command so Docker knows what command to use when the image is used to start a container. And I'm not really gonna go into any more depth about Docker or Kubernetes when we get to that point, because um, this is really more about how we're using them for scaling, um, and they also both have great docs. Pure convenience sake, I've set up a make file to build and run a Docker container and to tear it down, and this also publishes the port so we can hit the endpoint. Um, and now this just shows the result of the terminal command to build and run the image. Below there's uh, screenshots of the image and then the container in the, des the Docker desktop GUI, which I'm using. And so now we can spin up a Docker container and hit the exposed endpoint, uh, but this is still just running one instance. So we're gonna get this inside of a Kubernetes cluster so that we can start looking at what levers that we can pull for scaling. This could obviously turn into a whole Kubernetes talk quite easily, but I'll make it brief. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, to start really getting into the scaling meat of it, we'll create a deployment in a Kubernetes cluster with one pod. Uh, you could do this in Minikube, I just did this with, with Kubernetes uh, on my machine. And here's a screenshot of the deployment up and running. Uh, I'm using the, the Lens GUI, but you could look at this through anything else, like the Infra GUI or through canines on your terminal. And so now we've got one deployment and one pod running. Um, I have to port forward right now, which is in the make file, to be able to handle, to be able to direct the traffic through to the pods. Uh, but we're gonna add a layer, another layer later that does this for us. And here's where we really get into the scaling options. So we have two immediately available options to be able to allow our program to handle more traffic, let's say. And the first way is to scale vertically, which means adding more power or more resources to the pod. And this is where like, we've got our cafe all set up and running smoothly, and we're ready for big franchise dreams. But first, our investors are like other investors. Uh, want to see us do bigger numbers. So we, so we buy some more espresso machines, uh, we invest in some more cash machines, we hire more cashiers, we start like bulk buying milk. And then in our case, in the code, we're going to have to look at the resources that are available to our pod. So first we're gonna try setting the resources really low to see what happens. And the CPU and memory are resources that are available to scale up or down on your deployment. The pod runs inside a node and then the node will have a certain amount of available resource. The pods can use more than the request if there's more available, but they can't exceed the limit. And for this example, we'll just set them at the same low amount. We'll set uh, one milli CPU for CPU and 10 megabyte which apparently stands for mega binary byte, and that is something new that I learned when writing this talk. Um, it's tiny. So what happens if we spin this pod up and try to serve customers with it? If we try to hit our pod with 330, 300, it works. And then as soon as we get to 3000, the pod freaks out and dies. Um, it's oom killed, out of memory killed, because we don't have enough allocated memory for it. Um, and the pods will die if they're using more than their allocated memory. And we're using up a lot of memory the more Go routines we add, e.g. the more customers we have. So the pod boots itself back up. You can see the restart. Uh, but as soon as we try again with like 3,000, it's just gonna die again because there's not enough resource. And it's in this scenario, it's kind of like we've added more cash machines, but not enough people, and we just keep like overworking and burning our team out in the cafe. So let's add more resources. Let's just crank them up and see what happens. Because um, that always goes well, right? Uh, here we've got some like four CPU and some bumped up memory. And okay, our results are better, right? We get three point 3.7 seconds for 300,000 customers, but then once we increase it to 3 million, we get oom killed again. And uh, you might be thinking, like I often have, well you just keep boosting the resources, right? Like, just throw more memory and CPU at it. That seems to work. Um, and obviously, like the nodes themselves have limits, so Kubernetes isn't gonna just let us use up unlimited CPU and memory. Um, plus, it's expensive. Like technically, yeah, if you had your own server room, you could just go in there and start adding more resource. But um, more and more, we're using cloud services, um, and those charge money. So it's kind of like we, we went to Garrett and we're like, hey, uh, we want you to work faster. So we bought a ton of new machines and hired some more people. And Garrett's like, there is no room in this cafe for more machines. You've got to stop. So we stop. Um, and then here's where we get to look at our second option for scaling. We've kind of exhausted the options that we have before for our current cafe, and things are performing really well, but we, we want to open more cafes. And we've got this like blueprint created in our containers and it's ready to go. Um, and horizontal scaling is what it looks like. 
uh, in this scenario, it means us adding more pods to the cluster. More pods means more pods to accept traffic and more resources to deal with that traffic. And the nice thing about scaling up pods is that we can kind of equalize the resources. So if we have one pod with really high CPU and memory, we're paying for that. But if we have one pod with lower resources and we only maybe scale up during busy times, then we aren't paying for the resources that we're not using. Um, and this is where you can start getting into auto scaling as well so that the amount of pods is managed for you and goes up and down depending on the resources that you're using. And this is where we can adjust the replicas in our deployment to spin up more of the same container to be able to handle more traffic. In this case, I'm gonna set the replicas to two. So now we have two pods that can accept traffic instead of just one. We also need an ingress layer to be able to control the flow of incoming traffic. Uh, in the previous example, we port forwarded to use the port and we can't control which pod the traffic goes to. If we only scale up the pods, only one of them is going to be getting traffic to it and the others will just sit there empty. So we need an extra layer which sort of manages the traffic and distributes it across the pods. Um, and that comes in the form of another YAML file. So we define this as the kind ingress, and then we also need to make sure that there is an ingress controller running and ready to accept traffic. And then we're also setting up a service, which enables there to be network access to this, this group of pods, in addition to the deployment that we already have. And so now we have, oh, did I skip? Yes, I did, go back. Um, so now we have two pods running. Um, you can see them running here, the different IDs, they look the same. Um, and when I hit the local host endpoint over and over again, I can see from the logs that the traffic is going to one or the other, which means that now we can really, really scale up the amount of customers we can serve in one go. Because now we have two pods that are able to simultaneously handle 30,000 customers in under three seconds. The more pods we have, the more Go routines we can handle at one time since they are running independently. And we know our threshold roughly based on one pod, so we can keep the resources within our limits. And then we have traffic directed across the pods to spread the load. And so now all of a sudden, that 30,000 we can serve with one is able to happen exponentially. Um, and this is us opening more and more coffee shops. We're taking this nicely packaged formula that we have for a successful business and we're like, copy pasting it across the country. So now we're serving so many more people than we were able to before. And the next steps here is you can actually start splitting up the deployments for each go routine um, slash action. So each deployment would be responsible for a different action and would run them separately. Um, and this is where the magic really happens because you can start scaling in a, a much more granular way. So imagine that steam milk is a lot less resource intensive than the other actions or it takes less time. You could have fewer pods set for steam milk and maybe take payment as, as well. Um, and then if make espresso is the most resource intensive, you can set that one higher. And since these are independent actions and they're running their own Go routines, we can adjust the resources and the amount of pods for each one depending on like, how heavy the Go routines are going to be. And so now in our, in our big coffee conglomerate, um, we've maybe started like mass producing things. Um, and maybe if like make espresso is the most resource intensive, we have like a central kitchen where we batch produce espresso, which sounds horrible. Um, but we, we like ship it out to the stores so that we're splitting it up and allocating other resource to the items which take more time and resources. Um, okay, so this, this rounds up our coffee talk portion of the day. Garrett, thank you very much. Everyone, round of applause for Garrett for boldly volunteering. Um, 
we're, we're very happy investors. We're running a ton of coffee shops. We're taking over. We've promoted Garrett to business development director. Um, and we have this nice, like, packaged formula for making coffee and making money. Um, and now in a wild 180, uh, I'm going to talk to you about American football, kind of, sort of, um, but not really. Uh, we're just going to talk about how we actually did all of this uh, when we built NFL all day. Um, so this is, this is like a real life case study of, of what we just talked about. Uh, I will talk about a very brief architecture overview and then dive into this scenario where we utilized multiple deployments and multiple go routines for scale. Um, but I will tell you what NFL All Day is, uh, and it's basically, it's a platform for collecting, buying, and selling NFTs, and it's licensed by the NFL. Um, each NFT is called a moment, uh, and it's made up of a particular moment in an NFL game. And this is minted, or on the blockchain into an NFT, and then they're virtually packaged and sold in packs, and the packs are also NFTs. And then NFL is built on top of the Flow blockchain, which was also built by, by Dapper Labs, by us. Um, so this is a very, very distilled version of, of our backend <laughs> architecture, but basically we have a client and a server, um, and both of these talk to the Flow blockchain. Um, so this might happen either from the front end when users interact with their NFTs or it might be from our live operations team when they are minting or creating moments or packs on the blockchain. And they communicate with Flow by sending it transactions. And those are blocks of code which execute an action on the blockchain, something like purchasing a moment or putting it up for sale. And then the transactions are signed and sealed, and they might emit events from Flow, which others can use to consume blockchain information. Uh, and so in our case, the backend listens to and consumes these events to keep state with what is on-chain. And then we have the pack delivery service. So this is kind of an external service to this architecture which controls the packing and distribution of packs. Uh, part of this is to keep separate from our regular backend code and abstract away the knowledge of what moments are in each pack. So gun to my head, if you ask, tried to get me to tell you what moments are in a pack, I, I can't tell you. Um, packs, yeah, like I said, packs are also their own NFTs uh, in the NFL product, which means that they do need to be minted. So there's a lot of actions that happen within the PDS. Uh, there's the transfer of moments, there is the minting of packs, and then there's handling when a user opens their packs, and you have to transfer those moments into a user's account. And so now, imagine we're in a situation where we need to mint packs, a lot of packs, in a day, and be able to distribute, in theory, tens of thousands of packs with multiple moments, sometimes up to nine each, for each pack to users, and also be able to handle theoretically if all of those users wanted to open their packs at the same time. Uh, and also because we're dealing with blockchain, a lot of these actions involve sending transactions um, which take time to seal. So if we break down some of the responsibilities of the PDS or the pack delivery service, there are four main things that it's responsible for. There's checking pack events, so checking that these pack events that might be coming in from the Flow blockchain. There's minting, so that handles the setup and event checking for the actual pack creation. And then there's sending transactions, which checks a database table for prepared transactions to send to Flow and sends them. And then last, we have checking transactions, which is responsible for checking the result of the sent transactions. Um, and all of these things basically have to happen on a continual loop. Uh, they exist right as is inside what we call a polar, uh, which is basically a worker. It uses a ticker to run each action over and over again. Uh, and this is really similar to our coffee shop example, where we have these, we had those three actions, in this case four, um, which can all be performed independently of each other, but need to happen often and with increased load. 
So um, I also, I've, I've included some code snippets from our production code. I've taken a couple liberties like removing printouts uh, and extra pieces just to make it a little more slideshow friendly. But basically we start with no concurrency. The first implementation of the PDS started with each of those actions running uh, one at a time. And this is, this is the first implementation. So this, this looks pretty similar to what we had with our coffee shop example. We've basically got these four functions running one after another. And this is fine and it works, but it's slow. And it can't handle when all of those users go, I'm gonna open my packs, because I'm excited. And we're like, ah, the system doesn't work. Sorry. So we have to scale. Uh, and so the first thing we did to scale was break out each of these actions into their own Go routines so that now they can be run at the same time. And now with this setup, each one of these has their own ticker inside of their individual function. So they're like their own little polars running all in parallel. And this is a big improvement from before. It helps a lot with speed, but it's still not as optimized as it could be. So if we dig in a little deeper, um, the sendable transactions function is one of our bulkier actions because it's responsible for all of those transactions being sent to flow. Um, and this one needs to be as optimized as it possibly can be. Um, so we do some batching with the transactions, but we're still processing those one at a time. So now instead of running those one at a time, we spin those out into go routines to run them in parallel. And this is just like coffee shop, except uh, when we, it's just like the coffee shop example when we package up the three actions into the make coffee function and then turn each of those functions within those into their own go routines. Um, so it's like a go routines within a go routine. And sending transactions at the same time is basically like us being able to serve more than one customer at the same time. Again, here's a code example, um, condensed to what it actually looks like, but there's a loop looking through all of the sendable transactions, all of the transactions that we know we need to send, uh, adding a wait group and running them, and then deferring wait group done so we know to continue once all of those actions are finished. Um, and this helps a ton. This means we're able to speed up quite significantly, um, but th there is still some scaling we want to achieve. And right now with this example, we have a process that spins up four different Go routines responsible for four different things, one of which also spins up Go routines to deal with sending transactions. So it's pretty resource intensive. And we aren't getting a ton of flexibility right now with our pod structure because this is all happening within the same deployment. And here's where we get the part, here, yeah, here's where we get to the part that gives us the most flexibility with scaling. We created new deployments for each of the four actions that happen so that they're running in their own pods. And that way we can tr control the resource for each. And then for sendable transactions, because it's so heavy and because it uses so, so many Go routines, it ends up being the most resource intensive. Um, we actually spin up four deployments for that one action. So in the code itself, we use like an environment variable to check which loop we should be running and then run it. Um, but you could separate them out more concisely as well. Um, and so this is where we have each action quite nicely isolated and it's packaged up into these replicable deployments. We can basically start opening more coffee shops um, with these like well-organized resources allocated. Now there's an extra layer here um, that is unique to this being a blockchain product um, and that's the keys. So for each transaction that we send, it has to be signed with a key, which in our case is managed by our cloud provider. Um, we store the indexes for each of those keys in the, different trans in the different transactions that are sending deployments so that each deployment is responsible for a specific set of keys. Uh, and the number of Go routines being spun out is proportional to the number of keys. Yeah. There's also some additional checks to make sure that like, we aren't using the same keys um, or we aren't using keys that are already in use. 
And this was something else that we, we had to scale up for. Initially, we only started with one key, and now we're using almost 800. And so in answer to how did we scale while needing so many concurrent actions to happen at once, uh, we utilized Go routines. They are lightweight and a lot simpler to implement than in, in, a, in a lot of other languages. Um, we scaled horizontally and vertically. And then we split out into multiple deployments based on how many Go routines they were responsible for spinning up. Uh, in, in the beginning, with, without these enhancements, minting could take hours and a pack opening could take minutes, um, which is obviously not a good user experience. Uh, but now our minting speed is below an hour and pack opening takes a maximum of, a maximum of 30 seconds. Um, and some of that delay is unavoidable because of the nature of blockchain transactions needing sealing time. Um, and just to tie it all together, we in, in both these scenarios, in coffee shop and NFL all day, uh, we started from a place of no concurrency. And then we identified the areas that we could split out into their own actions that could run independently of one another and use Go routines to make them happen concurrently. For both cases, we also, well, with making coffee and with sending blockchain transactions, those sendable transactions, each of these had their own actions, which could be done at the same time to speed up even further. So we put those into Go routines. And then taking advantage of scaling, we tailored the resources to the pods depending on what we required and scaled up the pods to create multiple replicas of the containers for each. And then once we identify the actions and the Go routines that take up the most resource, we can package those into their own deployments um, and that's where we can start to adjust the resource allocation and replicas for them. So, how can this help you? If you need to scale, um, you don't have to start with no concurrency, but I find that's usually how things go. Concurrency happens when we have a need for it. Um, so then it's about trying to identify the pieces that can be run independently from one another, and those could be potentially split out into Go routines. If you also have actions within that that take up a lot of time and resource, you can further optimize for speed by using Go routines. Um, there's the scaling both vertically and horizontally that you can adjust. Um, and then you can get really clever with your deployments by splitting them out according to what is really resource intensive. Um, all allocating more resource or pods to a deployment um, that is heavy on Go routines. And that brings us to the end of my hour. Um, Thank you everyone so much. This has been super fun. Uh, these are the names of people that you don't know, but um, they were very important to the writing of this talk and I work with them and they came and saw my talk when I did a practice run through, so I wanted to give a shout out to them. Um, please feel free to chat to me on Twitter. I'm also around at the conference for the next two days. Um, and thanks so much GopherCon and, and everyone helping for the setup.